We're in the middle of working our way through uh, one of the bu- books in the Bible. There's, uh, anybody know? Is this 66? 66, right? There's 20, 39 in the front and 27 in the, in the last half. And, and we, we had been studying this message that Jesus gave. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it was kind of like what life looks like for disciples of Jesus. Kind of neat. And then what? And then that message kind of like through the ancient world. And one of the places that that message went to was Corinth. And so what we're doing is we're looking at um, a letter written to the church in Corinth who would have been maybe 30, if that many years, after the Sermon on the Mount. So people like us who want to figure out how to do this thing right with Jesus, but it was kind of like fresh out of the oven. And what the amazing thing, one of the amazing things about all of it is that, that even 30 years, just hardly barely removed from the event, they were still making a mess of things. And so uh, it's kind of good hope for us. Um, and, and then this sure and certain confidence that God is at work even when we aren't getting it together. But, but this much is true, that God intends that people like this, we're not the only church, obviously, you know that, we are part of the church. People like this need to figure out how to do this together, how to grow up together, how to stay um, loving and careful with, uh, with the one who made us and also with each other. So 1 Corinthians, it's going to be chapter 3, should fire up on the screen behind me. And uh, no apologies in this church anyway for reading big chunks of the Bible, because we think that the most important thing that gets said on a Sunday morning is what you hear from the scriptures. I'm going to do my best to try to make some sense of it, but um, be prepared for God to just like, not right on the head, just as we speak. Okay. So let me pray and then we're at it. Jesus, we do thank you that your heart is for us, not against us. We thank you that your heart would be as the living God to teach us. I mean, it just seems like maybe you could say, enough already. If you haven't figured it out, I quit. But uh, not, actually, not at all. You don't treat us like we deserve. Um, You treat us something far greater, far more generous, far more grace-filled. So we're going to open your book and read your words. We pray that your spirit would be moving up and down the rows of chairs and into hearts. We're not here to be entertained. We're not here to sort of pick up a couple of tips. We're here to encounter the living God. So let that happen. You're the one who can make it happen. In your name we pray, living Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, chapter 3, verse 1, going for it. Brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, uh, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you weren't ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? After all, what is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants, only servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned each to his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, stubble, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, then the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, and the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know 
that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you think that you're wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are in Christ and Christ is in God. Hey, we're, it's so, so good to be here. I must, at one point, there was some little people noises, and we just love that there's that problem. <laughs> Please, little people, know that you're want, wanted and you're welcome and you're loved. So if you're one of those parents that are like, ah, my kid just made a noise, you should have been here when Colleen and I had four little boys. It was just pandemonium and chaos. So uh, please, please um, relax and know that you're wanted and welcome. Have you ever had this experience? Yeah, anybody in your life at this point, maybe even, who is just making a royal mess of it? It's just chaos in their life right now. Someone you love, and, and you're watching them, and the wheels are coming off, right? And you want better for them. It's not like they're dumb. It's not like they're defrosting the deep freezer with a blowtorch. You know, like these are smart people, right? And they might even love Jesus and they might even share your Christian faith, but, but the boat is taking on water. Do you know what I mean? Like the zipper to the tent is open and the mosquitoes are pouring in. Like it's just, it's just chaos in their life. And to make matters worse, your friend thinks she's a genius. He thinks he's Einstein. He's really pulling it together here. He's got it all figured out. No, she's on the right track. Let me tell you about how it is, right? What do you do for a person like that? Do you do something for a person like that? Should you try to do something for a person like that? Well, that's the situation that Paul finds himself here in Corinth with the church. The believers in Corinth are making a royal mess of things. And at the same time, which makes it worse, is they think they're all geniuses. They all think they're super smart. I would say most of the time the right solution for that situation is just to pray for the person. Just to pray, not just to pray, to pray and to wait. Because it's tough for a genius to hear that he's not so smart. It's tough to have that news delivered, and there's a chance that if you start talking to that person, you're going to make an enemy. No matter how you say it, how you try to, you could lose the friendship, right? So it, it may just be best to let this thing play out. You know, you just sort of hand them over to the school of hard knocks and let the hard lessons be learned. You know, take your spot over in the line behind all the king's horses and all the king's men when it comes time for Humpty Dumpty to be put together again. Well, there is some wisdom in that plan, but it's not what Paul does here with the Corinthians, right? He actually did three things, super powerful things to try to help right the boat. Let me, let me just hear that with those words. Help, try to help right the boat. You see, because the only person that can right your boat is you, right? The only person that can right Einstein's boat is Einstein. It's not like you can write their boat, but there are some things that a believing friend could do to try to help to write the boat, and that's what Paul does here, three things. First of all, he reminds them of his history of loving them, and then he tells them as much as he can, straightforward, what's going on as he sees it, and then finally he reminds them of the big picture. So these, these three things. First of all, he reminded them of his history of loving them. You were mere infants in Christ, and I gave you milk and not solid food. What's that image of? Ziki got this. What's that image? It's an image of a mom, right, nursing a baby. It's this beautiful picture of love. Actually, one of the most profound pictures of love, right? And I know it's gonna. I know Paul's about to drop the hammer on him, but he uses that. He doesn't say you're all being dumb like streetcars. He actually says, no, actually, I nurtured you with milk. This is this profound picture of care. It's high-octane love, a mom with a baby. Right? So we've been watching our Emily, 
Emily's married to our Sam, and we've been watching her with little Lou, with uh, Eloise. I'm not sure as a grandfather I'm going to get away with calling her Lou, but we've got this three-month-old beautiful little girl, and, and the fun is watching your kids be parents, right? Your fun is watching this sort of mom's love for this little girl, and it reminds me of the way that Colleen was with, with our boys, especially with Sam, because once... Once Ben and Isaac and Seth came along, it was pandemonium. But, but when there was a one-on-one, when there was one-on-one, it was just fixation and fascination and celebration at everything. Look at, she rolled over onto her tummy all by herself, right? Look at, she's discovered her toes, right? Just everything is delight. And that's the picture that Paul uses here for his love for the Corinthians. I'm like a mom to you. See, Paul knows something. Not only is he like a mom to him, but Paul knows that God loves these people, that Jesus died on the cross for these people. And so whatever time he wants to pull his hair, or whatever point he might get frustrated, he, he never forgot, and nor can we ever forget, that we're dealing with a person who God loves. God loves enough to die on the cross for them. So this is powerful first connection, trying to make my way in a difficult relationship or a relationship that's going through a difficult patch. There's a powerful connection with like, let me remind you of my history of loving you. Right? Let me point back to those times where I got a chance to express it. First thing Paul does. Second thing he does is he, <clears throat> he speaks as straightforwardly as he can. So no passive aggression, no sort of like innuendo, Harry the hint dropper. None of that straightforward as he can. And he actually, three more things, he speaks to them straightforwardly about themselves. He speaks to them straightforwardly about himself. And he speaks to them very straightforwardly about God. So here's the truth. Love first. Second of all, the truth. Truth about them. I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. You're not ready for solid milk. There's something profoundly beautiful about a baby nursing and mom's milk and the whole thing. It's beautiful for a year, maybe a little bit more than a year. It's profoundly beautiful. There is nothing beautiful about an 8-year-old or an 18-year-old or a 48-year-old that refuses to grow up. And that's the problem here. Last week we were talking about what it means to live as a Christian in the spirit of Jesus and have him, his spirit fill you, and then you begin to learn and live differently. It's really quite something, but that wasn't happening in Corinth. They believed something. They believed the message of Jesus on the cross, but this whole idea of their characters changing from the inside out because the spirit of Jesus was living in them, they're becoming more patient, becoming more joyful, they're becoming more grace-filled and peaceful. It wasn't happening in Corinth. And Paul's like, hey, you're not staying in step with the Spirit. And the one piece of evidence, there was likely others, but the one piece of evidence that Paul gives for not growing up was, oh, did you see it in the passage? Jealousy and quarreling. You've got jealousy and quarreling among you, right? This isn't, this isn't of the Spirit. See, one of the indicators of not being in step with the Spirit is busted relationships. And that's interesting, isn't it? Right? Busted relationships. The problem wasn't with not being smart enough. The problem wasn't with you not making enough money. The problem wasn't anything but that they couldn't get along with each other. Friendships are breaking down at the church, right? They're divided. They're they're not getting along. And a problem like that starts here. I think it starts there in your chest cavity, but the problem starts here. What's, What's jealousy? Jealousy is insecurity that's convinced that somebody else is getting the attention, the affection that I want. I want it. What, what's quarreling? Quarreling is people not resolving disagreements. We disagree. It's normal. It's just the way it is with human beings. right? But not resolving disagreements, right? that eats away at human beings. Not resolving disagreements is quarreling. Not at least agreeing to disagree, but then get back to loving each other. right? That's that's quarreling. In both situations, jealousy or quarreling, believers are looking out for who? Who are they looking out for? Me, themselves, number one, right here. This is where the action needs to happen. Somehow, I don't know how this works, somehow in the church, in court, the quarreling and the jealousy was all around who the best leader was. I've been saying the best preacher was, but Lenita pointed out to me last week that 
Well, actually, it might not just be preaching. It might actually be a whole leadership style thing. It might be we like Peter's miracles the better than we like Paul's miracles. We like the way that Apollos is with people. He's so gracious and gentle, and Paul's a bit of a fish. It might have something to do with preaching, but it was about leaders, and they were all fighting in Corinth. Do you remember this from chapter 1? They're fighting about who the favorite leader was, right? It's kind of silly. Why would Christians spend their time arguing about something like, you got more precious things to spend your precious time on. Differences of opinion are what keep human beings sharp, right, and thinking. But being disagreeable ruins communities. Disagreeable is when you take a difference of opinion and you turn it against the person that you're talking to. Do you know what I mean? Like you could actually learn to celebrate new ways of thinking, but instead what happens, this happens a lot in our time in cancel culture, right? Instead of saying, oh, you see it differently, let me learn from you, what we say is you think differently so you are stupid or you're evil. When you become a Christian, you give up on being disagreeable. It's not part of your repertoire anymore. Let it go. That's what Paul's saying. These behaviors have to go. So he's honest with them about themselves. He's also honest with them about himself. Can I tell you what it's like on the inside here? Can I tell you what it's like? You know, I'm on, I know I'm on the docket for maybe the most favorite leader or maybe the least liked leader, but let me tell you what it's like to be on the inside as someone who loves Jesus and is leading in the name of Jesus. He says this, it's not a popularity contest, not at all. It's actually about serving. That's kind of an interesting picture for a leader, isn't it? Diakonos is the Greek word. Diakonos, some of you recognize it from deacon, right? Which actually means minister, servant. That's what it means, servant. So my job, Paul says, was to plant. Apollos came along and water. But you need to understand that we are both servants and we are praying like crazy that God does something to help what we planted and water grows, right? And here's the point. Here's the real point that he's trying to say, I think. And we are really working at it. We're really working at it. It's not easy. So we know as leaders that at the end of time, all of what we've done, all of what we've helped build is going to be presented to the Lord of all glory. And we pray and we've been working, hoping it's honoring to him and useful to him. And we know that all of this will be tested in this passage by fire. So either it will be shown to be useful and honoring to God or it'll be burnt to a crisp like a marshmallow at scout camp. One of these two things is going to happen for those who lead. What is it? Which of these outcomes is going to play out here? He's honest with them. He's honest with them about himself. He's honest with them about um, themselves. He, he goes on to say this. This is an interesting piece. He's telling them about how hard it is to be a leader. Good hard work. Genuinely good hard work. Right? And I think he's trying to hint to them about what it means to be a Christian. And he's saying to them, it's hard work here. It'll be hard work for you. Expect hard work. Expect for this to be difficult and it be worth it. It will require the best that you've got. When we think about this, he was kind of saying it to them. You work hard at your jobs. You bust in those videos about birds and animals and you, farmer, driving around in a tractor. You know, you go to school for these things and you practice them for, for years and years and years. Each of you have worked hard to get good at what you do. You're a welder, you're a plumber, you build. You know, you restore things. Whatever it is that you do, you teach, you're a surgeon. You've gone to school. You think about these things. Law school, you're trying to figure things out, and you've worked hard at it. And that's good, and it's important to have meaningful work. And then Paul is saying to them, why would you ever think that faith in God would be any different? Why would we think that he should just come to us, right? Any relationship that you've got that's worth anything to you, you've had to work hard at. And Paul is saying to the believers, Get ready to work at this. You're not going to be a natural at being a Christian. Oh, if it doesn't come to me, I'm just going to move on and try something else. No, not at all. Hunker down. Roll up your sleeves. You know, put some elbow grease into it. Why would praying be any easier than welding? Why would reading your Bible be any different, any, any more easy than your firefighter training? Why, why would that be the case, right? Give yourself to the good, hard work of being a disciple. Challenge yourself to read the Bible. Go for it. Oh, you didn't do it yesterday. Maybe you didn't do it the day before either. Do it today, right? Challenge yourself. Try fasting. You say, I did. Try it again. 
refuse to lose on this stuff, right? Ask God for the chance to forgive somebody. God, would you send me some way, someone that I'm going to need to forgive? Practice this stuff. Be in it. Get in. Roll up your sleeves. This is what Paul's doing. And he's letting them know that his own job as a leader is tough, and God's okay with it. And God's okay with it being tough for you as well. So he's honest with them about where they're at. He's honest about them where he's at. And he's honest with them. Even in this, this is the most interesting one. Honest with them about where God's at. Here's a summary of what he's saying about where God's at with what's going on in Corinth. God doesn't like you ruining his stuff. You weren't expecting that one, were you? Neither was I. I wasn't expecting that. You're going to hear, like, God just loves the, everything about you. God doesn't like it when you ruin his stuff. And I'm pointing you to verse 16 if you've got your book open. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives among you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred. And you, see that word? Together are that temple. You together, not just me, I'm the temple, you're, but us together, we are the temple, the dwelling place of the living God. And when we fight with each other, and when we root, run each other down, and when we avoid each other, we're kicking out the bricks of God's temple. We're ruining what's precious to him. And that temple is made up of you and me and us. How does that happen? How do Christians like ruin the temple? How does it ever happen? We're all like, oh, that will never happen. I would never do that. I think we give ourselves some leeway. We say, yeah, they deserve it. They, you know, they brought it on themselves. They're unreasonable. If I talk about them behind their back, it doesn't really matter. It's their fault after all. It tears at the temple. You're gouging the hardwood. You're, you're ripping the upholstery. You're soiling the carpet when we don't get along. It's brutal. Matters to God. When you quarrel, when you're consumed with jealousy or indignation or disdain for another Christian, you're, you're wrecking God's treasured house. And Paul actually has to say this. I don't know that I have to say this, but I'm going to say it because it's in the passage. He has to, has, actually has to say this to the people in court. Stop thinking that you're above this. Stop thinking I'm talking to someone else. I'm talking to you. He said, if you think you're so smart, you think you're so superior, you know, he says, become a fool. Become a fool so you can learn God's wisdom. They're strong words. They're needed words. Okay, so reminds them of his love for them, reminds them of bad speaks, deal with them honestly, and then, and then finally he, he reminds them of the big picture. This is a really interesting passage. I hope you catch this. End of 21, 22, 23. All things are are yours. I don't think we understand this. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, whether the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. You are in Christ, and Christ is is in God. See, when Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, he forgave all of your sins, but he didn't just do that. When Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, he forgave all your sins, and he gave you full assurance, 100% guarantee, confidence, promise of resurrection after you die. That's enough. But when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, he didn't just forgive your sins and give you this promise of resurrection, but he also says this, I share with you my inheritance. Everything that belongs to Jesus now belongs to Karen Weidman. Whew. All of it on you. It's yours. Full inheritance. Everything is yours. You will reign with him. God will come down out of heaven. Heaven will come to earth. God will make his dwelling here. And all things will be made new. And you will be in the middle of it because Jesus gave you his ticket. All things are yours. Everything that you've known on this planet to be wrong will be made right. And you will see it with your own eyes. Long, long established enemies will become friends. The lion will lie down with the lamb. The wolf and the goat will snuggle together. It's this beautiful picture. The world is yours. Life is yours. Even death. You know, death is yours. You go, well, I don't want it. Death will bring you closer to the one that has loved you all along. The present is yours. The future is yours. It's all yours, Sarah. All of it is yours. 
That's what he's saying. It's, you're richer than you think. That was what I was going to title this sermon. You're richer than you think. But apparently someone else used it. right? You're richer than you think. It's all yours. So here's the point. So what in the world, Tim, would we have to fight about? What in the world could we disagree about in any significant way that was going to ruin, would take away from, would have us distracted from all the things that God has given us in Christ? Jesus gave us the keys of the kingdom. Paul wants his believers to shape up. If that's you, and I, I would like you to shape up too. He doesn't want them, he actually says it. Did you see that part? He doesn't want them squeaking through by the skin of their teeth. I don't want you that. I don't want that for you. Yeah, you did just, you know, you were just, you know, not that. You come in generous, come in full orb, you come in robust, come in just like lots of laughter and settledness because you believe this stuff. It's deep inside your chest cavity. You're living it out. Get in the game. Get out of the old game. Leave the quarrels. Leave the jealousy. Put down your anger. Admit the selfish desires that can rule your life. Bring them to Jesus. Confess them. Declare war on them. Don't put any oxygen on them. And learn learn the rhythms of life in the Spirit. What do you do? What do you do for a friend that's making a mess of their life? Maybe that's you. Maybe you're the one making the mess of your life. Maybe it's all unraveling around you. And you maybe say to yourself, there's a little moment of whatever here this morning. You're like, man, I wish I had a friend like Paul. Wish I had a friend like Paul who would tell me, remind me that I'm loved. Wish I had a friend like Paul who would speak the truth to me. Wish I had a friend like Paul who would remind me what's true and right about the big picture. Well, you do. The Lord Jesus has done all this stuff in spades far more than Paul ever could. He loves you. He has loved you all along. He has a history of loving you. Apparently, um, Charles Spurgeon um, gave a sermon once. So he's a, he's a preacher from 100 and something years ago, maybe almost 200 years ago now. Spurgeon did this thing. And, and he preached from the prodigal son. So in, in Jesus' ministry, he told this really cool story. But the, the quick of it is that there was a father who had two sons that were both angry with him. One that stayed home angry. And the other one ran away angry. The one who ran away angry took all of his portion of the inheritance, went and spent it, wasted it, came back. Came back just disheveled and all beat up and stinky, smelled like pigs, and his shoes worn off his feet and clothes all ripped and stuff like that. And, and so Spurgeon preached this sermon on just three words from that story that Jesus told. And, and here's the three words. The whole sermon's on three words. You should be so fortunate. And kissed him. And kissed him. So here's Spurgeon telling this, giving this sermon about this one picture of a father's love for a son who'd made a royal mess of everything. And this is the father's first response. And kissed him. If there's one of you that's here and you're making a royal mess of your life and you're trying to think of a reason to stop doing it and to turn it around, maybe you just need to feel that and hear that again. The Heavenly Father kisses you, delights you, you stink, you're a mess, you smell like pigs, you took all the money and you ruined your life and kissed him. It's a beautiful picture. And then this father, this, this friend, this Jesus who tells you straight up what it really is. You know, we live in a time when self-esteem is the big story. Kids need to have their self-esteem built up. They just need more self-esteem, and you just need to feel better about yourself. You should feel better about yourself. Everyone's trying to pump everybody else's tires up. And and you know what? It's not working. It's not working. It's because the problem isn't self-esteem, lack of self-esteem. The problem is sin. We're living outside the design of God. And if you knew that there's a God who loves you and delights in you, and forgives all your sin, and will fill you and give you hope. That's your solution. It's not self-esteem. We're surrounded by self-help books, right? There was, uh, it, it was a, there's a gym that had uh, advertisement. It was something, something like this, join the body happy movement. Join the body happy movement, this gym. And it's like, well, <laughs> if I really was in the body happy movement, I wouldn't need a gym, right? <laughs> We're still like, we just can't get over this stuff. Problem isn't self-esteem. Problem sin. Jesus comes and not only shows us the problem of sin, but deals with it. And then invites you into a different future. All things are yours. 
You want to stop making a mess of your life? You want to move away from jealousy, move away from quarreling? Jesus is your guy. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, that you tell us the truth. And I know, I know I'm going to say this stuff, and the world that we live in, the wisdom of the age disagrees. People just need to be affirmed. People just need more self-esteem. There's obviously a great place for encouragement and for delight and joy in people, but, but we know that deep, deep down, we, were, we are women, men, made in the design of God, made in your image. You know us better than any human psychologist knows us. You know us better than any political party knows us. You know us better than our parents, our family know us. You're the one who made us and loved us and kissed him. Jesus, put that into our chest, we pray, deep in our chest cavities, and we would live there. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, friends, stand up, would you, would you, and uh, speak a word of blessing over you. You always know, say these things, right? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God. But when you say those words, the love of God, Lee, what I want you to hear is Dan kissed him, right? I want you to hear, like, that kind of love goes on you each day, every moment. Sundays you just get reminded of it, but it's the truth all the time. So the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day, tomorrow, forever. <laughs>